but thank you to those of you who've joined us. So this is our third Women for Global Fund session, and it's delightful to see uh, some of you get out of bed nice and early. Um, thank you all for being here. My name's Robin Gorner, and I run um, an organization called ASAP, and for the last year we've been um, the secretariat of a new movement called Women for Global Fund, which is not an organization, it's just a project that brings together a set of um, activities and organizations looking to advance gender equality through the Global Fund. And it was established as a consequence of doing some work for the Global Fund Secretariat and for UN Women, looking at whether gender equality was being advanced through the Global Fund. And the simple answer was, it was not. So what we are all hoping to do is to mobilize more action in that area. <clears throat> and in today's se session, what we are hoping to look at is what kinds of tools and support and technical assistance there is to support gender equality activists, particularly at a country level. So we've got an amazing set of people from the Global Fund, Marika Weinrugs, from UNDP, Susanna Fried, who has been reincarnated as Ludo <laughs> Bock for the occasion, um, from What Works for Women, Jill Gay, from UNAIDS, Claudia Humada, if I said that right, and from UN Women, Nazneen Damji. Um, and uh, this is also the third in our series, a different set of three, of working with UNDP to promote their gender checklist, which is a phenomenal tool to um, help uh, people working at country level. But, but to put this in context first, what I'd like to do is, is turn to Marika um, and invite Marika to speak a little bit about how this uh, fits together from the Global Fund's perspective. And then we'll hear from the sort of more technical support uh, partners as to how they can work uh, effectively together. Thank you very much, Robin. And I will be very brief because the floor is to these people. Uh, my name is Marijke Weindrox. I'm Chief of Staff at the Global Fund. I've now this week participated together with Kate in a number of events around gender equality and the Global Fund. So I hope the message is clear that we're really committed to do better on gender equality and women's rights and incorporating that in programs. And again, to repeat, not because we think it's a nice thing to do, it's the right thing to do, it's the thing we need to do to achieve impact. Um, the Global Fund has a gender equality uh, strategy and an action plan recently developed with milestones and uh, with concrete activities and milestones so that you can hold us accountable. It's available in the GFAN networking zone. The Global Fund is just a financing agency. We don't have country presence. We don't. We're not a technical agency, so there's no way we could succeed without involvement of partners on the ground, uh, women's networks, women's organizations, um, and technical partners on the ground. So I'm incredibly proud and happy that we work with amazing partners that uh, support efforts on the ground on gender equality. And um, I'm not sure who's going to be the first to present at you, Lida. Uh oh, <laughs> let's crank up the volume a bit here. Yeah, let's wake up a little bit more. <laughs> anyway, um, well, welcome on behalf of UNDP. Um, we're very happy to be here. This is the fifth uh, International AIDS Conference where we've been supporting the Women's Networking Zone. And um, we work in close collaboration with everyone here. Um, so I've been asked to like give a, a brief overview of uh, the UNDP gender checklist, uh, which basically looks at how can we integrate gender into uh, the new funding model uh, processes. So just to give a overview of the checklist, it really looks at all the different stages of the new funding model. Um, so how can we, first of all, strengthen national strategic plans and make sure that uh, gender equality and gender dimensions are included there. Then. <coughs> Looking at the country dialogue process, how can we ensure that there is representation of women in their full diversity? Um, then how can we ensure that women uh, are included in uh, the development of the concept note and to make sure that the concept note is really looking at the different gender dimensions of the three uh, diseases? Um, involvement in the independent review by the technical review panel uh, and grant agreements and monitoring and evaluation processes. 
So the way the checklist has been set up is to take you through each of these processes. And then at the start of the checklist, there's a two-page executive summary that just gives a short blow-by-blow, blow, uh, which is really useful to sort of see the flow. Um, so how can you use the checklists? Um, it basically provides concrete and practical guidance uh, to integrate gender transformative uh, components into the implementation of programs by the Global Fund. Uh, <coughs> if you use it, it can really strengthen attention to gender uh, within uh, Global Fund programs uh, as well as in the new funding model. And <coughs> um, as I said, it basically follows the procedures set out. So. <coughs> There's this <laughs> fabulous uh, sort of overview of the different processes, um, which we could have shown you if we had a PowerPoint, but no one wants death by PowerPoint on an early Wednesday morning. So <coughs> instead, what I wanted to do was to give just two short examples of uh, different steps, um, and then a, a country example to give you a flavor and hope that you will go online and um, get a copy of the checklist. So first one is the country dialogue. Um, if you're conducting your country dialogue, you need to consider three items. <coughs> uh, has the process been built on broad and comprehensive representation of civil society, including women and girls? Yes, check. If not, <coughs> go to your CCM and raise hell to make sure that it is. Two, uh, has the dialogue been designed and implemented to reflect a broad range of perspectives, including those of people living with HIV, women and girls, including um, women from key populations? Yes, check. If not, <coughs> see uh, what can be done about it, uh, either through, again, your CCM or through the joint UN teams on HIV to make sure that uh, we could set up, uh, for instance, different consultations throughout the, the process. Three, uh, are the gender dimensions reflected in the report of the dialogue? Because, of course, we all know a lot of things are being said, but what in the end is written down is what counts. Second example I wanted to briefly touch on is uh, the concept nodes. Uh, again, looking at the concept node, uh, it's just a, a range of checks that uh, you need to look at. Has there been a gender assessment analysis? Um, yes? Okay, cool. Uh, concept note includes recommendations for improving attention, attention to gender dimension of the three diseases. Um, has an investment case been made for integrating gender responses programming into national strategic planning? Uh, has there been explicit attention paid to addressing the needs of women and girls and so on and so forth? So um, that's just an example. And then finally, uh, as you might know, uh, Zimbabwe was selected as one of the early applicants for the new funding model in 2013. So um, we supported the process uh, around the submission. And four of the lessons learned from Zimbabwe <coughs> were um, the country was able to organize a pre-country dialogue, a women caucus meeting, uh, and a consultation with female sex workers that really helped to highlight the different uh, gender perspectives and dimensions. Um, <coughs> they were able to identify priority issues for women and girls uh, that were taken into consideration during the country dialogue meeting because of the caucus. Uh, on top of that, one of the things that really helped that there was an enabling environment um, because there was a gender component within the national strategic plan. So every time people would uh, go off track we could say, listen, this is in your national strategic plan, so you got to pay attention to this. And then uh, finally, um, we really made sure that women's representatives were part of the core team that developed the concept note so that it really helped in making sure that uh, gender was properly reflected. So uh, there was a brief overview. Uh, I hope it really triggered your appetite to go and have a look at the gender checklist. Thank you. Thank you, Ludo. And I mean, given we're such a tiny group, let's just sort of stop and pause at each point and see if there are any questions. So I mean, we haven't brought PowerPoints because that's not the kind of space this is. But 
all of these resources are really easily available to you. And I'm not just doing this to promote us because we're not an organization, but the womenforgf.org website has been designed to make sure you can get all of this information. So it's there, there's a summary of it, and there's the bigger document. But if you've got any... womenforgf.org. Yep, it's on the information, and I will. Sophie, can you just make sure? So, I mean, has anyone got any questions about this checklist? Because it's a really practical tool that goes step by step through how the Global Fund works. Anyone want to check in anything? Check in on the check in? Check, in on the check, check, check. Double check. Double check. Okay, so that's sort of very targeted to how the Global Fund does its funding under what's called the new funding model, but is getting a bit old. So the not so new funding model. Let's call it the funding model, the, funding model, the nice funding model, so it's the NFM. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so as I think you all know, the first stage of the nice funding model is having a nice national strategy. And so it's a good point to talk to Claudia about the work that UNAIDS has been doing on the gender assessment tool. So do you want to walk us through that. And again, that's on the website, so you can get it, but tell us about it. Perfect. So the Global Fund can be an intimidating body, you know, and this whole new funding model and all the acronyms can be really hard to get your mind around. And trying to get women's rights and gender issues into it, if in your country you haven't already been involved in things like the development of a national strategic plan, and meeting regularly with the CCM and meeting with your Ministry of Health can be a really daunting process. Now, it can be done, but of course, the best way to do this is to actually begin involvement long before you come to the development of a concept note. And one way to do this is to work in your country with your community to do a gender assessment of your national HIV epidemic context and response. And this is what UNAIDS with partners has done, is actually develop a gender assessment tool which takes you through a list of questions that you can ask yourself in community workshops to look at, you know, if my epidemic is showing me, for example, that men who have sex with men have a higher, um, are more vulnerable to the epidemic, you know, what does that mean from a gender lens? If women are predominantly the caregivers in my community, what does that mean? if women's rights organizations do not typically have access to the spaces where decisions around HIV policy and programs are being made, what does that mean? And essentially what the gender assessment tool does is that it takes you through this process of questioning and reflecting so that at the end of it, you have a very detailed analysis of what the HIV epidemic means from a gender perspective, what those mm -hmm. gaps are, but then also, what is missing in your response? So if you want, you say, okay, this is my epidemic from a gender perspective. The question, of course, is, okay, what do we do about it now? So the last stage of the gender assessment tool is precisely about that. It's about, from the gap that you've identified, defining priorities and saying, you know, these are the four interventions that are really gonna make a difference. And I'm talking about making a difference here, both in terms of affecting the HIV epidemic and in advancing gender equality. Now, the important thing to note is that the gender assessment tool has been designed in a way that it is meant to be implemented in a multi-stakeholder way. So it is not a literature review. It is not about, for example, a government commissioning a consultant to do a desk review of what gender implications the HIV may have, no. For the gender assessment, to be done with the gender assessment tool, it has to involve people at all levels in the communities, and it has to involve the different constituencies, including and especially those who they may not typically work with. So those from key populations, uh, women's rights organizations who may not be working on HIV before, young people, etc. And it goes through a series of consultations and workshops so that you have your gender analysis. Now, the next step, of course, is getting this into the National Strategic Plan. And we've seen, for example, to date in the last year, um, over 35 countries have done a gender assessment, and we have really great examples of countries 
that have then used that gender analysis or assessment as the basis to develop their national strategic plan. Because of course, when you're developing your national strategic plan, one of the questions is always, you know, why do we need to include this? You know, where's your evidence? Where does it matter? And of course, the gender assessment gives you all of that analysis and evidence kind of neatly packaged already. So it makes that tra transition from an assessment to an NSP, you know, much more smoothly. And then of course, the NSP should be the basis upon which the concept note for the Global Fund is developed. So it becomes all part of a neat kind of package and transition. UNH country offices are supporting the undertaking of gender assessments as are other members of the UNH family. So if you are in a country where you think there would be benefit of doing a gender assessment either because you are eligible under the new global fund um, funding model, because you have a new NSP coming up, or because you have other major strategic opportunities coming up, please do contact us. I have my contact information here if you're not already in touch with me. And we can help connect you to our country colleagues who can, again, initiate this process with you. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. So does anyone have any questions about the gender assessment tool? Please. Okay, thank you very much, Claudia. You know, most of the times when we talk of the global fund, we hear of the development, like the new funding model. As you earlier on said, it's like something big and most organizations feel like they're uh, they cannot be part of the process. So uh, from what you've explained, that it's very necessary for organizations, civil societies, organizations working with women, like gender equality, that, that they should get, get involved in the process early enough. Now what happens if you were not involved at the beginning? Is there any possibility for like an, an organization to get in the process midway? And if so, like how can we get involved midway so that we have the the minds of the population being represented, the real act, the uh, r real needs of the population being reflected in the concept notes. So the answer, the short answer is yes, definitely. It's, it's never too late to get involved. Um, so again, definitely get in touch, even if you haven't been involved in the early stages. Um, and I should say the process that I described about doing the gender assessment first, then your NSP, then your country dialogue, concept note, grant agreement, etc., is the ideal process. But this isn't an ideal world by any means. So we've seen a number of different approaches to this, including, for example, countries that do their gender assessment as part of their country dialogue process. And then we're also seeing some countries that are including it as an activity that is included in their concept notes so to be done after, so they realize it's a gap. So it really is never never too late, and your UNAIDS um, and other country colleagues should be able to help bring you into that process. I'm not sure if Marek wants to say something about this, but one of the innovations of the funding model is that, as you know, in the past with the Global Fund, everyone went into a big flurry and they wrote a grant application. And you know, you spent hours and money and people writing this up and it went to Geneva and it sat in a black hole and then it came back, yes or no. And so what's different about the new funding model is this whole concept of an iterative process. So you put, it, you put some ideas forward and it gets checked and then it comes back and then if it's not good enough, it goes back. So I think the idea is that there's a whole cycle of conversation that goes on. So there are lots of different points at which women and gender equality organizations can get involved. And I think there's quite a commitment in the Secretariat that if it's not good enough, it goes back, right? Right, exactly. And gender is one of the elements that uh, we look at. And concept notes have been sent back to countries because there was not adequate attention to gender issues. Robin, I have a question actually for um, for you guys. How easy is it for you to uh, get in touch with uh, the UN, with UNAIDS? Do you have ongoing relationships and? Uh, is there anything that okay, I see a lot of nodding heads? So just wanted to make sure that <coughs> it's not okay. Yeah, this is all nice. We're sitting here and you say just get in touch, and uh, then you're like, well, I don't know how to do that, but good. So are they good enough? How do you get in touch with them? Um, actually, we, we currently uh, worked with uh, the UN. It's 
in executing a project that has to do with uh, women's rights in a conflict zone in one of the localities in Cameroon. You know, it was it's, it's um, uh, an, a conflict zone that has to do with Cameroon and Nigeria, always in conflict. So the women, the women living there, are exposed to many serious issues. So we received a, a grant from UNAIDS to get the women know their rights, educate them to become peer mentors in their communities. Uh, for the, their peers, irrespective of their nationalities. So at least we are in contact with UNES. Rebecca, Cindy, Cindy? Uh, in Indonesia, uh, the relationship with UNAIDS and other UN agents uh, in its response, I think, is very, very good. And now, for to in the process of uh, new funding model, we get uh, technical assistance from UNDP and also from the UNAIDS. Uh, and related with the country dialogue, we uh, we get support from the UNAIDS for the community. Do you want to add to that? Thank you for us in Fiji. Um, we work very closely with UNAIDS, and uh, something very new now is that as uh, <coughs> as a local ne local network that we have for people living with HIV, the positive women have decided to establish a positive um, a, a group for positive women. So this is something uh, that I I will definitely take back home and definitely need your contact to ensure that this is something that we that the positive women can benefit from to ensure that all our issues are addressed at the national level. But definitely, we'll continue our work and relationship with uh, not only UNAIDS but all UN agencies back at home in Fiji is very very good. Thanks. Good news for the UN. Dolores, you're based in the States. Okay, well, you can go see them in New York. Um, <laughs> so let's move to New York then. Um, we're not, not, not physically. Um, Nazneen, tell us a little bit about the work on the indicators. Because, I mean, whilst we're, so we're talking about here's the model for the Global Fund. Here's the plan for the country. But, but someone once said to me, what gets measured gets done. Um, so tell us about how we get it measured. Okay, so I'm going to be brief. Uh, I've been told that I talk a lot, so I will be quick. <laughs> um, it's just so very exciting, indicators, monitoring, evaluating. Um, before I begin, I just want to acknowledge all of our partners. Uh, this process of developing a compendium on gender equality and <laughs> HIV indicators has been a long process, but it's been a very participatory process. So we've had partnerships. We took the lead, but we weren't really ahead of everybody. We were all kind of planning this together. With um, PEPFAR, USAID, Measure Evaluation was our technical partner. UNAIDS, UNFPA, UNDP, WHO, ICW, VSO. And we also had members of National AIDS Council's m and &E, uh, teams part of this process. So what I'm going to talk about is really what is the compendium? Why do we need it? How can it be used? And what's next? So just to say before I move on, that this compendium of indicators is really a compendium of programmatic indicators. It's not to replace what governments have to report on, on the global standard HIV indicators. We've got good news on that front. We have a intimate partner violence indicator now part of the global standard indicators. So your governments are meant to be reporting on the uh, intimate partner violence rates in the country in relation to HIV. We did a quick scan and I think 25% of the countries who reported last report in 2013 um, were reporting on the IPV. Unfortunately, the analysis was not very deep. It was just giving the data. So I think there's a lot of work still needing to be done. Okay, um, so the purpose of the compendium is really to provide guidance and suggested indicators that are already being collected. These are not new indicators that were being proposed or they're not new ones that have been tested. They're basically uh, indicators where data is already being collected, but they're put into a framework and they're being sort of prioritized. So what we're hoping to do is have a set, a very small set of indicators that everybody uses. So over time, we can be tracking trends, we can be doing analysis that is more comprehensive. Um, 
so why do we need the compendium? So as we said, and as Robin so nicely put it, if you don't count, it doesn't get done. So if you're not able to see what's happening, you cannot actually see where the gaps are. We do know that in gender equality programming in the HIV context, there are a lot of gaps. So this sort of piece is really to say, how do you use the standard ways in which we report to illustrate the different gaps? And then how do we do our programming better? Um, one of the things that's really important is that at the end of doing sort of the whole process of the gender assessment, of writing the concept note, you need to make sure that you're putting the right indicators into the framing of the monitoring and evaluation. Because if you don't have those there, you won't be able to know where you've succeeded and where you've needed to, to enhance. One of the things that I think is important also to note here is that these indicators in the compendium are quantitative, but that doesn't mean that you can't and shouldn't be doing qualitative studies as well. Because we know, and you will see when you scan through the compendium, that they're not necessarily the most ideal indicators. Remembering again that they are what already exists, there's data, data being collected, so there's a lot of room for improvement. And that's where I think quantitative studies are still very, very, uh, qualitative studies are still very, very important to uh, complete the picture. And then I just want to say we don't have PowerPoint here, and I'm so disappointed because I really wanted to show the slide with a concept conceptual framework, but just to say, because <laughs> I know that that would really wake everybody up. Um, <laughs> There was a conceptual framing of this using what I, I think you have all probably come across before, the, the underlying uh, determinants and the proximate determinants, looking at structural issues and individual and behavioral issues. And using that conceptual framework, we organized and pulled together the indicators. So it's really to say you need to be measuring things around policy, around stigma and discrimination, around gender-based violence, but you also need to be looking at things like treatment, male involvement, but also how are people aware and what kind of information and knowledge do they have of HIV? What is their sexual behavior? So at the individual level you're tracking and also at the, at the structural level. Um, one big thing that I think is, has been a bit of a breakthrough for us as we were doing this is we discovered there are many, many areas for future development of indicators. What we have on hand doesn't quite do it. So we've got a whole chapter in the back that lists out the different areas where we would like to see indicators developed. So just to say, I think one thing that we could do as a group and as we're going through this process of you know, working with the Global Fund concept notes, et cetera, is also pulling out some of those areas where we actually don't have measures and that we need to desperately, urgently do work on this. And finally, and it is finally, uh, I think at the end of the day, when we get to the stage where we want to be able to make sure that we have the evidence that everybody wants us to have in order to prove that we need to invest in gender equality issues, the analysis and the reporting is critical. So once you've collected all the data, one of the things that's really important is that you're presenting it and reporting it in a way that people can see where the evidence uh, lies. And for that, we can then continue to invest uh, going forward. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you. As you did not talk too much, well done. <laughs> Thank you, that was well under your seven minutes. Um, so, it, I mean, monitoring and evaluation and indicators can be a pretty dry subject, and it does sound a bit kind of <clears throat> full on, but it is, as, as Naz was saying, absolutely fundamental, and I think it's one of the, the critical things uh, that's also shifting in the Global Fund, isn't it? H how data is collected and reported. Does, does anyone have any questions for for Naz about this compendium of indicators and how it all fits together. Yeah, Dolores. So I, I, I'm, I'm really in, you know, excited about your presentation and all of that, and you keep saying you, 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 and, and I'm thinking of ourselves as networks of women living with HIV who don't necessarily have the capacity around monitoring and evaluation. And so my question is, is there opportunity to build that capacity? I mean, we have brilliant women, um, you know, who are educated, but the bottom line is, is that 
we're, we're, we're not qualified around M&E. And so we need capacity development and kind of what are the resources available to women network that really want to do this kind of research, but don't have the capacity or the resources. Question to Loris. Yes. That's a very good question. Thank you. I think I'll take it in two, two parts. One is that I know that um, ICW used to do some really good work around monitoring, uh, positive women monitoring change. It was a project. Now, I think one of the things that would be important is as we talk about the need to make sure women are engaging in processes and part of the response, you need to also include the support to building capacity. So we advocate I think everybody advocates that in the concept notes, there has to be a piece about women's participation in the response. So I would suggest that it's in that context that putting in an act sort of re request for re resources to do M&E would be a really obvious place. But now that's, you know, there's no guarantee there. But I think that's where our UN partners can come in. UN women in particular, we could definitely support work for partners who want to do M&E. One of the things I forgot to say, because I was trying to be short, is <laughs> one of our next steps is really to work with WHO to do some m and &E workshops in country, primarily with the national HIV uh, m and &E advisors, so that they understand what this compendium is and how to use it. But we'd very much like to have women living with HIV part of the process of those workshops, so that it isn't just government although it's government's responsibility to be ensuring that these indicators are part of their response, but that you need to be involved in the participation of developing what these indicators will be and how they can be included. Yeah? And just to add, the uh, 5 to 10% of the Global Fund grant uh, should be set aside for monitoring and evaluation. So um, that's quite a considerable amount of money. And then, as Naz was saying, in the development of the concept note, uh, if that, that gets highlighted, then there's a good opportunity to do that. I think one of the things that, that for me is really important around the M&E is the sort of demystifying. So not turning it into some kind of complicated science. It's also just about counting reliably and carefully the right things at the right time. One of the things that I know the Global Fund has done since it started to step up on its gender equality strategy is require gender disaggregated data. So that all sounds very you know, highfalutin, but all it means is that you can see whether women or men are affected in programming. And so when we did the research, Sophie and I and, and our colleague Hanka for the Secretariat and UN Women, we couldn't find out what was going on simply because the reports that came back to the Global Fund didn't say whether so many people on treatment were women or men or transgender. It just wasn't there, for example. And now they've said, we want everything to come back gender disaggregated so that when we look in two or three years' time at how they're traveling with their grants, you'll even just be able to see that simple piece of information. So it's really just getting to those basics. And there was a great presentation yesterday looking at different ways of estimating and recording the HIV epidemic with Chris Murray's group, UNAIDS and others. And I was so excited. I opened this copy of The Lancet and everything said, female population, male population. And it was like the first time I read a document that said that. So sometimes it can be just as simple as that, as counting the data. And I think Ludo's point is so important. There are resources out there, and here are these wonderful technical people who can uh, support. And also just to say, because monitoring and evaluation is becoming more and more important with the resources sort of flatlining um, to really make that investment case. So NAS, maybe as part of the workshops for the compendium, one of the items uh, of the workshop could be uh, working with civil society on actually doing the analysis of the data and using that for advocacy to move forward on it and to really... Cause we can yeah, measure what we treasure, but then if we just leave the data lying there, we're not going to get anywhere. And then I would love to see male, female, transgender as <laughs> the next step in this. Yeah, absolutely. 
well, let's hand on over to Jill, because one of the things we did when we started this whole Women for Global Fund movement is say this is about women in all their diversity. So very much inclusive of the whole spectrum of, of gender equity issues. Um, we've been hearing in the other workshops that one of the challenges around the gender equality strategy and getting gender into the Global Fund is it not being concrete enough. Sometimes the term gender confuses people. It all sounds a bit too complex. And I think some of the work that Jill and her group have been doing has been being very concrete about what works for women. And the title of the organization is even very clear on that. So Jill, can you tell us a bit more from your perspective? Uh, certainly. Uh, my name is Jill Gay. We have a website that's www.whatworksforwomen.org. We're listed as a key resource for PEPFAR, uh, the Global Fund, and uh, we're funded by both PEPFAR and Open Society Foundations. What we've done is collected all the scientific literature, all the social science literature, all the medical literature, and translated it so that it's easy to use for groups of women living with HIV, for civil society, for policymakers, for programmers. And we have 4,000 citations, a methodology, and we list out what does this evidence say. And it's something where you can easily access the web and access the different areas with it. We cover all areas of HIV, from prevention, treatment, care, the enabling environment, gender-based violence, legal issues. We've just done an update of the legal issues. And you can see the strength of the evidence. You can see what the key interventions are and what the supporting evidence is. And you can then cite that in your concept note or in your national strategic plan. And it's a way of making it very concrete. So without naming names, a concept note from X country said, we have a problem with gender-based violence in our country. That won't lead to a very specific result if you put it in your strategic plan or your concept note. But if you look at what works, you will see that one of the interventions for gender-based violence is to have community-based participatory training on gender norms that addresses gender-based violence that's drawn on some very key research, such as um, the Image Project, Stepping Stones, et cetera. And then we list all the citations. And so, and then you can look at the Global Fund for what indicators would m then measure those outcomes. You could do surveys. Um, and so th another evidence-based uh, intervention would be to scale up harm reduction and to have pat particular gender sex-segregated groups for women who use drugs than for men who use drugs, for counseling, for harm reduction. Uh, and these are things that then can go into the concept note. We've been closely partnered with UNAIDS. We're sort of stage four of the gender assessment tool. So once you've done your gender assessment and you've identified all these key epidemiological and gender issues that are problems, what do you then propose? Some things will be very country specific, and, but some things you can take from the global evidence base, and that's what we hope our contribution will be. We've uh, been used in many different countries in many different regions, and I'm happy to, to answer any questions. Thank you, Jill. Okay, so I mean, again, the big innovation, or one of the big innovations with the Global Fund is getting the investments where they make a difference. So investing for impact is one of the 
one of the slogans. And I think what, what Jill's describing is so important because often when we talk about gender, it gets all a bit highfalutin and so much easier to say, well, we know ARVs work, which we do, but what about the rest? So here's the resource for that. Any questions, comments? Is it too early in the morning? I mean, I think what you've got here is an amazing array of tools. One of the things I just um, asked Sophie to make sure we had enough copies of for anyone who doesn't have them is the Gender Equality Strategy Advocate Action Plan, which Kate Thompson and her team in the Global Fund have been developing. So this talks about how very concretely the Global Fund is going to work with its partners and with civil society to make things change. And these have got all of the Global Fund documents on because that's a lot lighter than they would be. Um, so, you know, you've got this massive array of tools, but I guess like, like Ludo was saying, it will be really interesting to know from you, what are the kind of constraints and barriers? What more do you need to make it easier for you to get involved in, at the right stage? Is there more that these people can be doing? Uh, that all of us can be doing to support the efforts at country level because we know that's where it really, really matters. Yeah. Um, I think uh, one of the things that will request that needs to be done for greater impact will be more uh, building of capacity, more capacity building, especially for indigenous uh, and rural organizations, you know, other women, organizations of women living with HIV or uh, marginalized uh, communities where you, ha you have women who do not have, uh, who are not aware of their rights, you know, like building of their capacities. Because most of the times the projects which are being built at a level of, you know, global form, yeah. they'll have an impact to a certain extent, but most of the women will be missed out. So I am re recommending, you know, for proper, uh, more building of capacities for these women. Also, um, Issue of resources like funding, uh, availability for grassroots organizations who are really carrying out grassroots-oriented uh, activities targeting marginalized and rural women, and also coming back to the issue of M and E, as uh, it was earlier on mentioned, is very important for us because most organizations find it difficult becoming out with. Uh, they have beautiful projects which have really great impact in communities, but when it comes to M and E, they are lacking. So it's something which is really serious. I'd like to answer that if I could. So one of the things that's very important in the new funding model is the requirement that at least 30% of those on the CCMs, the country coordinating mechanisms, be women and also that there be some with gender expertise. So you need to work with your CCMs. They're all listed for your country on the Global Fund website. And contact them and say, we are women working, and you need us. And what are you going to do to include us in the process? And if you don't get a satisfactory answer, there is a, a fund portfolio manager who manages the fund for that country, and you can complain to that person and say, we're women uh, working on the ground, and we want to be included in with the C CCM, but they're not listening to us. Help us. And there's also funding to for capacity training on gender that can go to the CCMs. So you have to work through your country mechanisms. Rebecca. Um, I, I think it was early this year or last year that I had attended a Women for Global Fund uh, training that was conducted in uh, Bangkok. And sadly, I was the only representative from the Pacific. And uh, for people living with HIV, I won't speak specifically for Fiji, but for the Pacific, we're a very small number, all put together, excluding PNG. Um, and uh, if, if this sort of same training could be conducted specifically for people with HIV in the Pacific, you know, to ensure that, that they are also benefiting from the same thing, that, that the Asia-Pacific region has, has a bigger number, uh, um, because we, there just wasn't enough money to get, it, it's, it's costly to get all these Pacific uh, positive people over to Bangkok to get 
to have the training conducted there. And then again, the issue of our CCM, you know, when we're sitting in at the CCM, we're, we're, we're almost invisible, you know? Like, unless you're a very strong person. In Fiji, oh yes, the, the positive, the positive rep, rep on the CCM makes a lot of noise, but it's not the same in every country, especially in the Pacific. Uh, how can, I mean, you know, we need, we need, we need stronger support, you know, and if we have that stronger support from, from the UN agencies and such, you know, this, this is something that we'd really appreciate to ensure that we'd be able to carry out these issues. I visit Pacific Island countries and my peers, positive women, they, they share the violence that they have encountered. And even, even back at home, my own peers, the, the violence that they encounter, and it's, it seems like we're helpless. Because if we go to the Women's Crisis Center, it's, it's, it's covered in, in, in women issues, not specifically focused on positive women. And that's something that we strongly want to ensure that, that positive women, because we, ha we, fa we face double stigma, double discrimination, and we want these issues to be addressed. And I'm fortunate to have undergone the Women for Global Fund. But honestly, I'm not really confident enough to be able to, you know, to, to, to um, how can I say, um, to say that, I ha that I'm fully, uh, uh, I wouldn't say qualified, but, uh, but to be able to, to, to take on this task on my own. You know, I need my peers in the Pacific with me. And, uh, and, may, and if, if this is done in that way, through having all our peers together, having to undergo the training together, this would really strongly uh, enable us to, to tackle this issue on the ground in the Pacific. Thank you. It's Jill, and I just wanted to note that you have raised a key indicator that is not in the compendium that needs to be um, put forward. And it's what is the levels of violence against women living with HIV? And that is something you could propose as part of your M&E for uh, what you're doing with, for the Global Fund grant, that, that there needs to be operations research on violence against women living with HIV as a way to figure out what are the next steps to address that critical issue, because we know it's a very critical issue globally. I just want to acknowledge what you said, because I think that you know the whole issue of building capacity and making sure that women have the skills and the confidence to be able to stand up at the CCM and say something, because we've, in PNG in particular, was part of a five country program that we supported. We've got a poster on the evaluation and the evidence that came out of that. And it was precisely that, that nobody's lacking in terms of commitment or women don't want to not be involved. It's about when you're there, how intimidating it is to be in that space. Now, the question I have for you is really how can you, is there a way to link into existing women's organizations? Sometimes I know there's a lot of discrimination because of HIV, even amongst civil society partners. But there are also mentors and, and women's organizations that can support. This is not uh, uh, instead of training and capacity support. This is alongside. Because I think that's where there's oftentimes strong movements, uh, women's organizations who are very well established, have good connections with government, with the ministries of gender and women's affairs, but they may not be taking on HIV as an issue. And that's where I think making the connection to them is also a critical piece of, of the effort. But I fully take your point about capacity building, and we hope to be able to continue to invest in that kind of work as UN Women as well. well just to say that in my previous life, uh, I was with UNAIDS as a partnership advisor in Vietnam, and one of the things that I did there uh, was to really work with uh, the CCM civil society representatives to help prepare for the CCM meetings and to work with them afterwards to uh, disseminate the information to their different networks. Um, so that, that's one thing that you can also go to uh, the UN country officers, to the, the UN joint teams to help su with support in that. And that doesn't even have to cost a lot of money, but... Um, Yes, Cindy. Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe I just... Oh, yeah, okay. 
maybe I just want to uh, give some, uh, an example from Indonesia. Uh, in the previously, we don't have a representative from uh, key affected population, especially especially from people living with HIV. But uh, then we ask CCM to have representative in uh, to have representative for people living with HIV in Indonesia. And now we uh, there is there are two representatives from people living with HIV from one from woman and one from uh, men, and now uh, there is also we want to uh, add more representative from key affected population, and it is include from a sex worker also. Uh, drugs user also, and then uh, and other key affected population in the CCM. So, and in uh, in our representative in CCM, we have uh, our own mechanisms. So, if the representative in CCM cannot coming to the every CCM meeting, there will be an alternate. So, uh, we will always can oversee all the CCM meeting. So it sounds like a really important point here about capacity building. So capacity building is about knowledge and strength and knowing what's going on, but also having that ongoing support that you're not alone. And I really hear that from what Rebecca's saying and what you're saying, Cindy, that it's just if one person knows, that's not good enough. And as Naz says, where are the other organizations? So. There's a lot of momentum building. Um, I know that we're getting tight for time, so I just want to give each of the panelists a, an opportunity to say some closing remarks, but also throw back out to all of you a question that I think Mark Dybul raised at our session yesterday, which is most of the other networks of people of key affected populations are starting to get their voices heard in the global fund processes. There is a momentum building. Not good enough, not enough yet, but it's starting to happen. And the concept notes are starting to reflect those issues. But the gender equity issues are still not coming through. Why? And what needs to happen? Because you heard from Marika at the beginning, there's a really strong commitment and will from within the global fund. It's not just about the secretariat. It's not just about the technical partners. It's not just about women's networks. So what more needs to happen to make it change? So maybe if I can invite the sort of panelists to reflect on that and also any final comments from those of you who've joined us today. Who would like to start? Marika. I think really not, not an, a question that I can answer. It's a question that we struggle with. Um, I think the help from technical partners at country level is going to be critical. But the most important part is your involvement. And um, I think some of the questions you raised and the issues you raised about being shy, being the only one and speaking up, but there's technical partners to support you. There's support available to build capacity of civil society organizations, including women's groups at country level. So. My most important message for you would be please engage and make sure that your concerns will be addressed. What I wanted to say in, in the end is <coughs> sort of building on what Robin was saying. Y you're not in this alone. And I think two no more than one and the more networks and organizations you can work with and rally around your cause. <coughs> um, not only women's organizations, but also organizations of sex workers uh, outside of your general sphere. The, 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 the more you rally together, <coughs> the more you can learn from each other and the stronger your voice will be. We will be there as a sort of like technical support and to help uh, guide these processes, but it is for you to also reach out to other people and to really um, yeah, make your voices heard and we're ready to support you in that. First of all, it's important to keep fighting. We all know that. 
and um, it will strengthen your case with both the government, PEPFAR, Global Fund, to draw on the relevant parts of the evidence base, and you can find that at whatworksforwomen.org. I would end just with a reminder that our job is really never done. So for example, Cameroon has done a gender assessment, but that doesn't mean, oh, you know, we're, we're good to go, no, no. And then it means we have to follow up, you know, is it in the NSP, then is it in the concept note, then is it in the grant agreement, then is it being implemented? So just, you know, to keep that energy up and keep working together so that we, you know, you, so that you don't feel alone in it. And you know that there are a range of uh, gender experts, activists, technical bodies that are committed to working alongside with you. So I just want to add to everything that everyone has just said by saying that let's be clear and honest that this is a political issue. It's not just a technical issue. And as much as we'd like everyone to be so supportive of gender equality issues, they're not. And there's real tension. So, I mean, we know you know it better than I do, so I'm telling you something you already know. But just to say, don't be shy. Don't be shy to hold governments to account for the commitments that they make in New York. They look lovely. It's written up in excellent documents, but that's where it stops. So um, this is your job. Your job is to hold governments to account, and our job is to help facilitate that process. But just to make sure all of our eyes are wide open that this is political as well as, um, you know, I, I think at the point of technical, we've kind of covered it and there's a lot, people know what needs to be done. It just uh, somehow gets stuck in, in the middle of that. Thanks. So in terms of the political, let's hear the final comments from the floor. Any other sort of final things that you want to say from your perspectives? Um, I just want to say that irrespective of uh, the political side of um, the, the, the political way in which things have been done in Cameroon, we would uh, continue to do our own part, part of the job to ensure that uh, we reach the target communities, to ensure that we involve those in, uh, who are most affected in the response. Because we know that um, if we do not do our own part, then we'll, uh, we'll not be getting to any zero by 2030. So we'll do what we can and we'll struggle to um, work hand in hand with uh, the government, the CCM, and to get our voices heard. Sophie and Kate, and then we will end the session. You'll have to stand up though, my friends, because it won't go that far. Hi. Um, so I, I, I just, um, I think one of the biggest struggles and is that maybe women now understand the new funding model, they understand the strategic entry points, but I don't always think people know what needs to be done. And I think we're not very good when we get into the door and we're sitting at the table being very clear about what's actually going to make a difference in women's lives. And, and, and as people don't understand gender, when we go and speak to them in countries, I think advocates need to be smarter, clearer, more strategic about what we're actually asking for because people don't know what to do and they want to maybe do something sometimes but there's so much to do so what is it that we need to ask for that is going to make the difference and I think that is something we need to be uh, looking at is, is that. Okay, do you want to... So yes, just, just a couple of points um, to make. And, and first of all, just on the paint, uh, point that Ludo made about um, uh, reaching out to other constituencies as well, because I was in a great session uh, with a great presentation by Violetta Ross yesterday, when she was talking about the work that um, she did with um, positive women's groups, reaching out to sex worker groups, trans groups, uh, uh, lesbian groups, and everyone was saying, look, you know, you're never going to be able to work together. It's just not going to work. And the results of that work were just amazing because they did. They realized that, yeah, there's differences and those differences are important and need to be respected. But there's also huge commonalities. And I think you know, at a country level, 
the importance of actually just reaching out to some of those other groups and building those coalitions and advocating together is really key in, in getting your voices heard and in getting other people and other groups to take on your issues and to really understand your issues. So I just wanted to make that point. And then just secondly and lastly to um, ju just talk briefly to the issue of participation and engagement. Um, because, I mean, one of the great things about the new funding model is we've taken it beyond the CCMs, you know, because CCMs, as we all know, we're sometimes very closed shops. So, you know, we have this opportunity for an ongoing and much broader country dialogue, and that really brings the opportunity for more engagement. And, um, and there is, a, as people said, um, support from technical partners around all of that there's in addition there is specific support from global fund where the technical partners aren't able to provide support for engagement for cr for community rights and gender related um engagement in the country dialogue process and we also just la um, wanted to share with you this it's on the memory sticks it's called engage it's available in four languages and we worked on this very closely with um, with civil society groups, with um, I think some people here, I think Sophie was involved in, in creating it with um, delegations and with, and with technical partners. And it's really a guide to how to engage in the global fund process at country level. Uh, so thank you. Well, thank you all very much for coming so early in the morning and whilst there was a plenary on. And I think what we've heard is you're not alone. And that was one of the key messages. And there is this sort of very vibrant partnership. There are those of you who know what really needs to happen at a grassroots level. There are people here to support you with how to monitor, how to assess whether things are right, how to work your way through the funding model, how to get evidence about the programs that work, and very importantly, the money to make sure those programs actually uh, take flight and make real changes in, in women's lives and, and across the whole issue of gender inequality. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you to the Women's Networking Zone for hosting us today.